if you married one and you and your husband or wife's with you, why don't you give your wife a kiss right now? Tell her, honey, happy National Lipstick Day. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, today is National Lipstick Day. Wow. My wife doesn't have any lipstick on because I took it all off. So um, <laughs> if my lips are looking real supply, it's because of that. So um, we're married, so we're allowed to do it. We're allowed to do more than that, but that's none of your business. Uh, um, you don't have to fear no more, worry no more. Okay, I'll get into the word. All righty. So we have been in this great series called Relationship Hashtag Relationship Goals. And um, uh, we, it's been a great, great journey. And I know that the Lord has been really doing a great job of healing our relationships and restoring our hearts towards one another. And I think that's very important. And uh, this is not just a marriage thing. We're not just focused on marriage. We are trying to cover as many bases as we possibly can because relationships in the day and age that we are living in can be so, uh, uh, so varied. They're, they're so many factors within our relationship. And then last week we talked uh, a little bit to you about single and satisfied. And uh, I want to kind of uh, do the second part of that today and we, as we look at it because and the reason we call it single and satisfied is because we want people to understand that, uh, you know, being single doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. How many of you understand that? And uh, as a matter of fact, there are more single people now than there are married people. And uh, so there is a, there's, a definite, there's a definite need to address some of these things. And, and uh, uh, you know, not everybody that's single has to be married. Not everybody that's single wants to be married. So we know that and understand that. Singleness in itself, you can be whole as a single person. You, you never want to marry somebody just because you don't feel whole. How many of you understand that? Is that if you are not happy with who you are and you marry somebody, now you're going to have to make two people miserable and we are having enough just dealing with you. So uh, we understand that. And 1 Corinthians says a very great thing in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, our key verse, and you should all know us by now. Very simply, how many of you can quote this verse to me? Mm. Boy, that was pathetic to be honest with you. But let's try it again. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says... Do everything in love. And so even in our dating relationship, we must do that according to the way God has for us. And then last week, we used this incredible few verses out of the book of Proverbs. And we talked about wisdom and understanding. Let me read it to you again. It says, use wisdom and understanding to establish your home. Let good sense, somebody say good sense, fill the rooms with priceless treasures. Wisdom brings strength and knowledge gives power. Battles are won by listening to advice. Say listening to advice and notice and making a lot of plans. So obviously when we are building something, obviously when we want to pursue something, whether it be a, 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 a life, a relationship, a career, what, a business, whatever it is, if we're going to build something, we must build it on a sure foundation. And the Bible encourages us that we find the wisdom that we need. And, and wisdom is, is having the information and the knowledge in order to do it. But there's something else that comes with it, and that's understanding. Understanding is not only knowing what to do, but it's knowing why you do what you do. So there's a reason why we operate the way we operate. There's a reason why we pursue certain things a certain way. There's a reason why there is something on the inside of us that says, you know, life is not working out the way that I want it to work out. So therefore, I've got to change my approach. I've got to change what I'm doing. If you are, if you are uh, running into a wall and running into a wall and running to a wall, how many of you know sooner or later you've got to start looking for a door? Sooner or later, you're going to say, wait a minute, I mean, I've got 14 knots on my forehead because I'm always, you know, making the same mistake. I've got to wise up a little bit, slow down a little bit, and kind of look at how do I make a good decision? How do I make a wise choice? And then we talked about the fact that, you know, if you're single, the greatest principle is in order for you to understand it, it's not, it's not looking for the right person, but it is being the right person. And there are three aspects of that, and we covered the first one. We talked about relational maturity. And the question we ask there is, uh, am I relationally equipped for this marriage? I mean, relation, do I know how to handle relationships? If I'm having a hard time handling relationships before I'm married, I'm going to have a hard time handling relationships after I'm married. How many of you know, once you say, I do, there's no magic suddenly that you have? It's not, you know, if you did something in a certain way, if you were, you know, short and bald and, and fat and you got married, you don't change. That's the same way you're going to be the next day. And, and we, we recognize that. We realize that. So you have to have relational maturity, knowing how to deal with people, knowing how to handle people. And honestly, I think most of us need to be taught that. 
because within the context that we've grown up in, within the experiences that we've had, within the backgrounds that we have, a lot of us haven't had a healthy concept of how to build healthy relationships. We live in a world that it's all about what? Me. Thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate that. First service were not honest at all. They had to repent. So I'm, I'm really glad you guys are mature enough to be able to say that. So, it, and it's all about me. It's all about what I can get. It's all about what I want and how I want it. But we understand that that's not God's perspective of healthy relationships. So let's talk about this today. Let's continue this. And I'm not going to keep you very long, just for about the next four hours. And we'll kind of work our way through this. But how do you know you're the right person? Number one, we said relational maturity. Number two, write it in, is emotional maturity, emotional maturity. And the question that we ask there is, am I emotionally prepared for this marriage? Emotional maturity, am I emotionally prepared for this marriage? Now, we're living in a very modern world, and we're living in a kind of a millennial generation. So I thought, you know, just to kind of look at it, you know, how would a marriage proposal be for a millennial? So this is a, I want you to pay attention to the screens. This is a millennial marriage proposal. Check it out. Oh, it's so insane. This is, there's nothing better than this, right? This is the greatest. Unbelievable. Look at this. I can't believe I. <gasps> Madison Marie, will you marry me? Oh, babe. Wait, you hired a photographer, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. I am so sorry. Do you, mind, um, do you mind actually coming a little bit closer? I just, I don't know if it's going to share that well, if it's like what? so far back. Madison Marie, will you marry me? This is still from the back. Do you mind if we just switch spots so that the camera's... Madison Marie, will you marry me? Oh, my, my hair is up and I didn't realize. Do you mind if you scoot back so we get the skyline in the background? Madison Marie. Cut. Sorry, I don't like my middle name. Uh, can I take a look at that? I just want to see if it's... I wanted this to be a surprise, but at least you could have given me a hint. I don't look good in any of these. Okay. I'm sweating right now, and this can't be good for my complexion. What are you talking about? The lighting is, like, really harsh. I probably look like a Picasso painting. It's... <sighs> Cloud-wise, what are you thinking? More? And yeah. See, when, you, when you turn around, is right. it already going to be open? Yes. Madison Marie. I'm already wearing it. Oh, sh wait, all right, take it. Okay. Give me the ring back and oh. then we'll start from the top. Okay, okay, okay. I read a blog, the perfect time for engagements is like 5 to 5.30. I'm trying to do something fun for you and you ruin it. Ruin! Every... Oh my gosh, okay, I let's don't try know it. if I can even do this anymore. All right, here we go. Well, you're going to be that, you're going to be turned around. Right. Anyway, so I'll just start right. on my knee. Everybody Thank you. Knee. You got a double chin in this one? Switching things up, we're going to have camera guy here, sound guy right here. John, continuity sake, right knee. I'm going to go left hand. It's going to be bigger, right? Can you Photoshop that? As soon as he opens the box, we're gonna have a sweeping zoom motion and then coming all the way up, revealing the beautiful skyline. I'm going to say yes, and it's gonna be great. All right, from top. So then I'm gonna either go here or here. What do you okay, say? How about, or we could go this way. Right? I feel like no one sees me though, because my face is pointed out. No one needs to see your face. <laughs> say it a little bit more like you believe in it. Like do it, how would I say it? Marrying you would be hashtag relationship goal. Who says that? You will! Oh. Rolling! I just want it to be like how they do it in the movies. I don't know, I'm just not feeling the production value. That's... Production? What What do you want from this? Oh, uh, I don't know, first thing that comes to my mind, La La Land. La they didn't even get married! Spoiler alert! Cut. Madison's engagement, take 43. Great, hurry, first positions. Put that somewhere. First positions? What? <laughs> It's so beautiful. Yeah. Look at all these likes. <laughs> Very interesting, isn't it? I mean, it, the, the question really is, are you emotionally mature enough? And here's a cute statement from a boy whose name was Alan. His age was 10. He said, I don't know who I will marry, but I'll tell you one thing. She'll have to sign a paper that says... She takes out the garbage, and I get to watch whatever TV show I want. Now, that's funny because he's 10. It's not funny when he's 30. Are you with me, somebody? I know an awful lot of people that get and go into marriage, and they are not emotionally ready for that marriage and what it's going to take. Uh, they're not emotionally prepared to do what needs to be done to make a marriage successful. Uh, they're not emotionally prepared to give it 100%. 
They're basically kind of drawing lines and saying, well, this is kind of 50-50. And if your marriage is 50-50, you are not emotionally prepared when you draw lines and you say, well, because here's the thing, you're always going to fight about what part of the 50 is your part and what part is the other person. So there's always going to be a conflict within this. Don't go into a marriage for what you are going to receive. Go into a marriage for what you are going to give. Marriage is about giving your life away for the benefit of someone else. It's about understanding what it is, and, and you should be emotionally prepared for that and emotionally have some sense of maturity if you are going to engage somebody's life for the rest of theirs and for the rest of yours. Now, there are four signs of emotional preparedness that I want to just give to you briefly today, and here's the first one. You can write it in. When you are emotionally prepared, there is no rush into marriage. There is no rush into marriage. You show me somebody who's emotionally prepared, and I'll show you somebody who can wait a few more months before they marry. The best advice that I can give you and give a couple that is contemplating marriage is, is when they're not sure whether they should get married or not, the best part is to wait, slow down, stall for some time. It's better to do it on the front end than on the back end. How many of you know you don't need to jump into marriage real quick? Can I get an amen, somebody? You can give it a little bit more time. Listen, if it's going to work, the signs of it going to work will show up. If it's not going to work, I'm telling you, the signs of it not going to work is going to show up. Look at what Proverbs uh, says in Proverbs 9, verse 2 and 3. I love these verses. Some of my favorite verses, especially the, the second and third verse. Notice, enthusiasm without knowledge is what? Come on, yell it at me. Is what? So you can be enthusiastic, oh, I'm all happy about this, I'm all pumped about this, but you don't have the knowledge. The Bible says that's what? No good. Notice the next three words. Haste makes mistakes. When you're in a hurry, i, I got to do this, and you feel the pressure of that, you're going to make mistakes. And verse 3 says this, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. So we, we make haste, we, got, you know, we kind of force things, and we kind of work through the process real quick, and then when we make mistakes, oh, well, you know, it's God's fault. I mean, you know, you know, God did this to me, and He didn't. You did it. You were the stupid one. Are you with me, somebody? Uh, look at Isaiah 26. I love this out of the Message Bible. Listen to this. The path of right living people is level. The leveler evens the road for the right living. We are in no hurry, God. We contend to linger in the path signposted with your decisions. So Isaiah is saying, you know what, I'm willing to wait. Why? Because God is not in a hurry, and if God is not in a hurry, I don't have to be in a hurry. And if you're going to make a marriage work, don't rush into it. Only fools rush in. Don't rush into a relationship. Make sure that it's going to work out. Now, why is it? Why do we feel the need to rush into a relationship? I, I really believe there are three things, and uh, you can just dot them down real quick. It's because we base relationships on physical attraction. So, you know, he's like, oh, man, I'm so attracted to him. I'm so attracted to him. Uh, let me say something in a very loving way. How many of you know attraction is not going to last? There are things that are going to not be in the same place they were when you meet somebody. Uh, are you with me? I mean, it's just, it's, it, this morning I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I went, ah! And I realized I was looking at myself. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how, you know, I'm 28 years old and sometimes I just don't look at it. Uh, you know, and my wife is so loving. You know, I said, honey, look at my face. She says, I've been looking at it, you know, for many years. So uh, she said it in a nice way, not in a bad way. But, you know, we base it on physical attraction because we are physically attracted. That's great. But you cannot build a relationship just on physical attraction. Understand that. Secondly, we base it on emotional connection. You know, just because we feel close and we feel that this is the way it's, it's supposed to be. We'll talk about emotions here in a moment, but how many of you understand emotions come and emotions go? You can be happy about something now and 10 minutes later un unhappy about the same thing. That's what emotions, emotions lie to us. They kind of, they move all the time. And so you cannot base it just on an emotional connection. And here's another one. Why do we rush into relations? Because we base it on the fear factor. Honestly, if we are truly honest, we're afraid we are going to be left out. You know, we're afraid we are going to be an, an old maid or we're going to grow, you know, grow old as an old man by ourselves. Let me tell you something. Uh, to be alone is much better than to be lonely and in bad company. I have talked to enough miserable married people that were in relationships that they were lonely, yet they were married. 
They were in relation because there was really not that, that fact of connecting with one another. And, 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 and that's something that is that's sad, that you can be in a relationship, but yet you feel lonely. I, I'd rather be by myself. I, I will not be lonely. I'm with Jesus. Is anybody with me? And, uh, you know, and if, with, if I'm with myself, I'm in good company anyway, so it all works out. You and I have to understand, sometimes what happens to us, we feel this, I've got to do it, I'm getting old, I have to do this, and you know, my friends are all getting married, and they're all moving through this place, and you know, I need to, and sometimes the church puts pressure, you know, just because, you know, because somebody is single, oh, you know, you need to get married, you need to get married, and, and you know what, you need to get married if God has called you to be married. That's what you need to understand, and you have to know this, because otherwise we operate in fear, and when you operate in fear, you are going to eventually settle, and you settle instead of having God's best. There's no reason you have to settle. God will bring the person that He has meant for you in your life if you trust Him. If you walk just like Isaiah said, hey, I'm following the signpost of God. I'm doing it God's way. I'm not going to do it my way. God will bring that person. And just in our, in our situation, even if He has to deliver him or her in your front door, God will do it. you got to trust Him. So don't rush into it. The second thing about being emotionally mature is that not only is there no rush into marriage, but selfishness is under control. Selfishness is under control. One of the greatest signs of emotional maturity is our willingness to prefer others before ourselves. Uh, We've covered this verse before, but I want to show you this again in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5. It says this, when you do things, anybody been doing things lately? That's five of you. Let's try it again. Anybody been doing things? All right. Now watch this. When you say, when I do things, watch this. Do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than to yourself. Do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. In your lives, you must think and act like Christ Jesus. People who are emotionally mature are people that understand that selfishness has no place within a relationship. Now, we all go through selfish phases. I've been selfish, you've been selfish, we all have been selfish. And there are seasons in life where we are selfish, but somebody needs to be able to love us enough to tell us the truth and say, hey, listen, you cannot do that. You cannot have a healthy relationship when the only focus is on you. When you are the only one that people have to dance to, and you are the only one that plays the tune, and everybody has to dance to your tune. There comes a time, and especially when it comes to marriage, where we have to begin to put others before ourselves. Who is the most selfish people? Our little kids, right? Because they are still learning. Now, some of us are acting like little kids, but we are way older than that. I don't know if your kids were like mine, and, and you know, when they were younger, much younger, they, uh, you know, when you give them a toy and they play, and then maybe their brother wants to play with it, and then, you know, they're not playing with it, then they're like, no, no, I was playing with that. And then, you know, we'll get a friend over, and then they're playing with that, and then, and all the, why? Because it's all of it. No, no, that's mine. What, what's the first thing a child says? Mine, 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 mine. Oh, that's mine. No, that's mine. Everything is about, everything around, revolves around them, and that's okay because they still have to learn. None of us, I've never had to teach my kids to be selfish. Any one of you had to do that to your kids? I never had to say, now listen, son, I want you to understand when your friend comes over, you, 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 you know, when he plays with a toy, grab it from his hand and say to him, it's my toy, my daddy bought it for me, I'm playing with it. You need to do it. Did you hear now? Repeat the words from daddy's mouth. Say, mine, my toy, it belongs to me. Has any of you had to do that? No. What did you have to do? Now listen. Listen now, Bobby. You know, when, you know, when your friends come over, you need to play with them. And you need to play, what we say? Play nice. Now, what do we mean by saying play nice? We're saying don't be selfish. Don't be self-absorbed. The problem is some of you are 40 years old and you still don't play nice. Because it's all about you. Everything is about you, and you've got to understand, if you're going to have healthy relationships somewhere, you've got to get selfishness under control. You cannot have pride be your guide. You cannot have selfishness be the root of your motivation, that it's all about you, all about, you know, you, know, you don't care about my needs, you don't care about what I want. Well, what about the other person that's with you in the relationship? It takes two. 
It takes two to make a thing go right. Right? It takes two. It takes two people that are willing, that are unselfish, instead of just always thinking about them, but they also think about the other person. When you are married, you can't, I, I don't wake up in the morning and look at Pastor Moran and say, wow, you know, guess what, girl, I don't feel married today. See, but like, well, wait a minute, sucker. Can you look what's on your hand? It's called a ring. We made a covenant. I don't care how you feel, you are married. Amen, Pastor. Isn't it? That's really good. It applies to my wife. All right, then just nudge her. It's for her then. But we all go through phases like that, but we have got to become emotionally solid. An emotionally solid person is a person that's not always thinking about themselves. And they don't, and, and, and here's the thing, and sometimes we have to be very careful. We use circumstances and situations to manipulate another person to eventually do exactly what we want to do. And we have, to, we have to watch that. That's, not, that's actually kind of a sick kind of person. You, if you want to manipulate others in order for them to do what you want them to do, and you manipulate them through things, you manip, manipulate them through action or words, you've got to be careful for that. That is not an emotional, stable individual. You've got to have selfishness under control. Now, let, let me ask the married people. Do I have any happily married people in the room? Yeah. You, you should have said it louder. I mean, let's try again. Do I have any happily married people in the room? All right, now let me ask you happily married people, has there been a time in your marriage where you had to be the least? You don't sound excited about it, but it's not exciting, but you had to be, right? Somewhere you had, there's got to be give, and there's got to be unselfishness within a relationship in order for it to be healthy. Selfishness has got to be under control. Selfish people do not make great marriages. Amen. That's for those watching live stream. That was for you, all right? Now, let me, let me give you another thought. So what are we talking about? We're talking about what? Emotional maturity. We're talking about four signs of emotional maturity. There's no rush into marriage. What was the second one? <laughs> it's on the screen. It's not, it's not a trick. Okay, there's the first one. Go back to the first one. Let's look at the first one. What's the first one? What's the second one? All righty, and the third one is going to be, I have to be able to read the overhead, all right? That's the third one. No, here's the third one. I am financially prepared for marriage. Now, hear what I'm going to say. When I talk about financially ready to make this kind of commitment, I'm not saying you have to have all the money in the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you have to have some sense of financial intelligence or finan a financial quotient, meaning you know how to have a healthy conversation about money and also know your strengths and your weaknesses regarding money. Whether you, we know that we have people that are spenders and we have people that are savers. And in God's humor, you always have spenders and savers marry one another. And, and, and you say, what do you mean by this, Henny? What I mean by this is, do you know how to budget do you know how to work with somebody else in your finance? If, you, if you're 25, 27, and you've had a job for the last five, six years, you've made independent financial decisions. But when you are married, you no longer make decisions independently because now it is working together. The two shall become what? One. It's now working together. And so you cannot have, it's an unhealthy thing when a husband has all control over finances. And just because you say, well, I'm the one, you know, working and my wife is at home. Let me tell you something. If she's at home with kids, that woman is working. And she's working hard for her money. Are you with me, somebody? Now, you, you might be mad at me or whatever, but there's no place for a controlling, manipulative husband to build a healthy marriage. If you understand, if your wife is home and she's got kids, let me tell you something. Any day of the week, I would exchange. I would rather go to the office when my kids were younger than be home with four toddlers. I've tried it. I barely survived it. Several times I would say, okay, honey, it's your, it's your day. You know, I'll watch the boys. You go. By the time she comes back, the house is on fire. I mean, I'm, it, it's crazy. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing in order. I mean, it's just, it's up. I mean, you try. We had, at one stage of our lives, we had three kids in diapers at the same time. We had our kids on top of one another. You know, we just, you know, we wanted them, you know, while we were still young and uh, had the energy. I'm glad. Otherwise, I would have killed them. I'm telling you honestly. 
So, it, I mean, it's just, it, and, and, what, and think about it, three kids in diapers at the same time. I used to beg my wife. I used to bribe her. I used to say, I will pay you to change that diaper. And she said, no, sorry, you can't pay me enough. My, our oldest son, let me just say, there's nothing to do with the sermon, but I'll tell you, and he's not here, so I can embarrass him. He's in uh, uh, New York, so I can tell you about him. That kid was what I would call the world's greatest pooper. And when I mean the world's greatest pooper, I could never understand how he could poop. And when you clear, he had poop from the back of his neck all the way down. To, I mean, I, I couldn't, how did you get it there? Has any of you ever wondered that? He's unbelievable. I mean, that kid could poop, man. I mean, oh, thank God he got, you know, potty trained, you know, last week. So it was really exciting. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, you have to ask this question. Do, am I able to have a conversation about money or am I just going to be self-absorbed? And let me say this to you. Some, some wives are better in managing money than husbands. So it's okay. It's okay to say, honey, you know, you're going to handle this. And, 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 and husbands, you get a budget. And we work on this together. It's okay to have that conversation. Whoever, listen to me. Whoever has the strength, that's who we need to rely on. So if your wife is better at it, let her handle the money. If your husband is better at it, let him handle the money. It's okay. But we've got to have, we got to have the ability to have a conversation and talk about these things. You say, Henny, why? Here's why. Because once you're married, there's a lot of things coming into play. And once you're married, here's what you don't want. You don't want a whole bunch of surprises. Because he'll be so, well, you know, I didn't know. Well, then I asked the question, well, did you not have some premarital counseling? Did you not have a conversation? Did you not talk about that? Did you not work through the process of saying, okay, how do we handle money? Did you not observe somebody handling money? You should ask those questions. It's healthy. It's just meaning I am prepared to walk in this relationship, not blind. I walk in this relationship with an open mind. Because some people are just, they, they just are not financially smart. None in second service. None of you. I know I'm talking about first service. All right. And I did tell them. And girls, let me add something about this financial preparedness that I believe is crucial. You need to understand something very clearly. God gave Adam a job before he gave him a wife. Tap your neighbor in the shoulder, say, hey, I know somebody like that, all right? Look at this. Look with me in Genesis 2.15. Watch this. Again, out of the message. I love what it says here. God took the man. Somebody say, God took the man. And notice, and set him. Say, set him. So God took the man and God set him. Where did he set him? He set him down where? In the Garden of Eden. Now he's going to tell you why he set him down in the Garden of Eden. To what? To what? To what? Help me out. To what? So God took the man, God set him, and God set him to do what? To work the ground and keep it in order. So what did God do first for the man? Did he give him a wife or did he give him a job? Gave him a job. Now look at Genesis 2.18. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion, a help meet. And by the way, God took her out of his side. Why? Because it is a mutual working together. It is a covenant relationship. God did not take Eve from his feet so that he could dominate her. He took Eve from his side. God did not take Eve from his head. So, you know, she could sit on top of his head. No, he took her from a side. There's, it's a working relationship. It's a covenant relationship that is healthy, a mutual, powerful relationship. Now, listen, let me say this to you. I did not fall off the life experience truck yesterday. You say, Henny, what do you mean? When that tall, dark, and handsome, smooth-talking, nice-smelling stud muffin, when he comes and tells you, oh, I don't have a job, and yes, I'm still living with Mammy, but it's only temporary, because you see, girl, I've got a dream. I'm going to make it big. I'm just waiting for my moment. I'm just waiting for my destiny. Then listen to me, girl. You look that stud straight in the eyes, and you tell him, great. Now go get a job. Even if you work at Burger King, I'm okay with it because we are not our jobs. Are you with me? doesn't matter what. We are not defined by what we do. It's okay. Then you go get a job and we'll believe God together while you work for your dream. No job, no ring. No ring, no fling.
All you single ladies, all you single ladies. Put your hands up, up. Okay, are you with me? Some guys have what I call an enlarged procrastinate. That's what they have. You didn't get it, just let it move on. It's, you know, it's always going to be tomorrow. It's always going to be another day. No, 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 no. Yimmy, Yimmy, you are becoming today what you'll be tomorrow. The decisions you make today will determine your destiny of tomorrow. The seeds you sow today will determine your harvest tomorrow. It is impossible to reap a new harvest when you're not sowing new seed. And, and actions are seed that we sow for a future we desire. So you have got to act what you want, what you desire, you are not going to one day suddenly act because you married suddenly now, because you said, yes, I do now, suddenly there is no magical wand. Are you with me, somebody? The behavior that you have right now is highly likely the behavior you are going to have when you are married. So you've got to get that under control. You've got to understand. And you say, Henny, why are you so hard on this? Can I tell you why I'm so hard on this? Because I've seen too many people cry rivers of tears after the fact. Why are we talking about this? We are talking about this because I would rather build the fence on top of the hill than the hospital at the bottom of the hill. I'd rather us be preventive and help people understand the commitment that they are making to one another. And let me just add something to this. Don't marry for money. You can borrow it much cheaper, so don't do it. Ask the question, am I financially prepared? And here's one more when it comes to emotions, and we'll slow this down. Love is based on commitment and not on emotion. That's, that's emotional maturity. We love these verses. We hear them all the time at weddings, but they apply to all of our lives. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is patient and kind. Love is. Somebody say, love is. Love is. Not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. If you want to have a, a, a relationship that's healthy, that's vibrant, that's alive, then it's got to be based on a commitment, not on an emotion. Why? Because otherwise we have what I would term wiggle lines. And our emotions wiggle. Our emotions are up and emotions are down. Don't ever make decisions based on an emotion. You, make, you base a decision based on what God wants for your life and based on what God has called you to do with your life. Not on an emotion, not on a feeling, not on a whimp, and not on a, on a quiver in your liver. You know, oh, I felt it. And therefore, that's, that's, that's unhealthy thinking. You're going to say, what does God's word say? How do I want to live my life? What is the result? Where do I want to end up? In what place do I want to be? So I want to make a, a healthy decision. I want to make a wise decision. Let me just say this to you this morning, that you understand this. Do, do you realize that, that God wants to do incredible things in your life, but you've got to let Him. God wants to do something amazing beyond anything you can imagine, but you have to allow God to do that in your life. And that means you've got to base your relationship not on an emotion, not on a feeling. I love the kid who wrote a report on Benjamin Franklin. He said this, Benjamin Franklin saw a pretty girl one day, and before long, they were married, and he discovered electricity. Uh, that's exactly what you'll discover, is electricity. But you've got to be emotionally mature. You've got to understand the difference between love that's based on commitment and not an emotion. You know, I, I want to add this just so that you can understand, is that we we've got to recognize our weaknesses, and we've got to recognize our strengths. And in recognizing, when we say recognizing our weaknesses, we are not being down on ourselves. How many of you know being down on yourself is not a healthy thing? Am I talking to anybody? Just, oh, you know, I'm no good. I can't. That, that's not a healthy thing. That's not, that's not what we are talking about. But we all have arenas in our lives and areas of our lives where we say, you know what, this is not, I'm not doing too good here. And so, and that, and, and, and so therefore, I'm going to trust God that God would help me not only to see my weakness, but also see my strength. The reason God made you the way He made you, the reason God gave you the gifts He gave you is for His purpose and for His plan. And when God puts two people together, because I honestly believe that God puts people together, when God puts two people together, there's a greater purpose 
This God, God wants to do something with your life. And when I say that, I don't mean that you will preach or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that God wants to use your life for the glory of God. As a matter of fact, do you know that the Bible says the, the picture that we, that the world has of the relationship between Jesus and the church, you know what picture is that? That's the picture of a godly marriage. You see, so when the world looks at a godly marriage, what do they have to see? They have to see the way that Jesus loves the church is the way that the husband loves the wife. Is this too heavy for you? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Are you sure about that? So that's the picture. So, so church... If we're going to show a picture to the world of how much Jesus loves the world, how much Jesus wants to connect with them, then here's where they're going to see it. They're going to see it in how husbands treat their wives. So husband, let me just ask you a straight out question. If you are not married today and you're going to become a husband, are you willing to love your wife like Jesus loves you? Because if you're not willing to love your wife like Jesus loves you, then do me a favor, don't get married. Because that's the picture that we need to see. Remember, we're not talking about marriage from the concept of what the world says what marriage is. We are talking about the concept from what God says what marriage is. And it, it's laid down very, very clearly. And so it's a, high, it's a high level of expectation. But here's what God does. I love this. God empowers us to do it. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we know how to live our lives in such a way. Let's ask one more question here because I need to land this plane. You guys are getting really nervous. <laughs> the last one we're going to talk about today. So let's just recap. Can we recap real quick? So we said the first question we ask is, am I relationally mature? So the second question we ask is, am I emotionally equipped for this Marriage and under that we had several points. What do we say? Yeah, you got it. Just read. It's okay. You just read. There's no rush into marriage. Selfishness is under control. Financially prepared for this marriage and love is based on commitment and not on emotion. And let me give you one more. And this is crucial. It's what I call spiritual maturity. Am I spiritually ready for this marriage? Now, I want you to look at this passage with me uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, and, and uh, I'm reading it out of the New Century Version. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. You are not the same as those who do not believe. How many of you understand that? So watch this. So do not join yourselves to them. Now, he's not talking about not fellowshipping. He's talking about the joining of a relationship, about a marriage. So do not join yourself in marriage to them. Good and bad do not belong together. Light and darkness cannot share together. How can Christ and Belial, the devil, have any agreement? What can a believer have together with a non-believer? The temple of God cannot have any agreement with idols, and we are the temple of the living God. Say, I am the temple of the living God. Now watch this. As God said, I will live with them and walk with them, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. By the way, this is the only biblical command that is directly related to the selection of a marriage partner. Hello. This is the only one in the Bible right here. In other words, Paul says, do not be unequally yoked. He says, do not mess around. Do not get emotionally involved with non-Christians when it comes to marriage. And he said the reason why is because he says, what fellowship can there be? You know, you are here to serve God. They are here to serve themselves. He says they are diamet diametrically opposed to one another. Now, let me go a step further. You, if you break this down, the probabilities of a good marriage, when you marry someone that is not a believer, and by the way, the statistics say that you have an 11 times greater success rate if you marry someone of the same faith than you. If you marry someone that doesn't have that faith, it makes it much, much worse. It's not only to assure success in marriage. The number one reason why you should not marry an unbeliever is because it is disobedience to God. Now, folks, listen to me. Think about this for a moment. If you are connecting yourself to somebody who does not believe and you believe, you basically as a believer, yes, what you're doing, you are disobeying God's word. You're getting emotionally involved with an unbeliever, and words cannot 
express the tragedy of the situation. Why? Because the Christian is literally mocking God by reneging on his word and by reneging on his commitment to Christ. As a matter of fact, I'll take this even a step further. A Christian is committing idolatry by falling down before someone else other than God and they are blatantly disobeying God who said we are not to marry someone who does not believe. Life is not complicated, folks. You as a believer are not to be most involved with a non-believer. And I've heard, listen, I've heard the excuses. I've seen the pain. How many times have, we not, have I not heard this? But pastor, I'm believing that he will get saved. Have you heard that? I, I believe he's going to get saved. Listen to me. It's never right to disobey God's word to bring about a right means. So if you, if you have a desire, then, then rather say, you know what? I'm not going to connect in this relationship, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for his or her salvation. That's what, so you say, God, you save him, then I'll date him. This is too much for some of you. Don't use dating as a vehicle for trying to get somebody saved. That's manipulation. That's unfair. We don't manipulate people to come to Jesus. People in themselves must find out, hey, I'm a sinner and I need of a Savior. We can't manipulate people, you know, say, well, you know, if you just hang around me and, you know, say, and kind of say, I'm the prize, you know. No, you're not the prize. Jesus is the prize. Come on now, somebody. Am I talking to anybody in the room? Maybe I'm talking to those watching my live stream. Stop that nonsense. And start understanding what God wants to do, and, and it'll save you a lot of tears. A, 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 there's a lot of things. So many times when I used to, and I'm putting the emphasis on used to, when I used to do premarital counseling, trust me, I did a lot of it. And I would sit down with couples, and here's what I would do. I would always have what I would call the value conversation. The value conversation would be, what is it that you value? And here's the way that I would do it. I would tell the, 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 the uh, future you know, groom and the future bridegroom, I'd say, this is what you do. I want you to go home. This is a separate exercise. And I want you to write down the 10 things that you value the, from, from uh, importance. So number one, the number one priority, all the way down to number 10. And then I tell her, you got to do the same. I said, don't talk to one another about it. So this is a separate exercise. Then we come back and we're going to talk. So I want to get her list and his list. And then we're going to compare lists. So we can kind of check out. And they say, well, why is this important? Because it's about what you value. Because you're always going to be drawn to what you value. And what you value is what you're going to operate in. The re- Listen to me. I'm going to make, now I'm going to make all of you mad, but I'm going to say it anyway. It doesn't apply to you, but I'm going to say it anyway. The reason certain people don't do certain things is because they don't value it. You only do what you value. If you are not a giver today, and I'm talking financially, it's not because you don't have money. It's because giving is not a value in your life. If you don't spend any time with your kids, it's not because you are too busy. It's because you don't value your kids enough to be with them. It's not because you lack money. It's not because you lack opportunity. It's because you don't value it enough. Because here's what, whatever we value, we will find a way to do it. Am I talking to anybody? Is, am, am, am I being mean? No. Uh, and if I am, so what? <laughs> because you know what? I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to, I'm, try, I'm trying to help you. And sometimes we got to cut you open and we got to cut some stuff out. It's not fun. It, this is surgery right now because I can feel you. Like, yeah, I don't want to be put out. Oh, don't cut me. You need to be cut. <laughs> because we're trying to, because why? Because God is trying to put something in us. And so I would explain to them. And so here's what I would have. They'll bring their list to me. And I will look at their list. And then, then I would say, now, okay, I want you, you guys to understand that, 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 that I'm trying to help you here. And then I'll say, okay, now, Bo- let's just say Bobby and, and, and Trudy or whatever. You know, if your name's Bobby and Trudy, please forgive me. I'm not trying to pick on you, all right? And, 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 and I would take Bobby's list, and I'll go through Bobby's list, and I'll take Trudy's list, and I'll go through Trudy's list, and I'll say, now, hey, guys, do you realize we're going to have a problem here? And I say, Trudy, at the top of your list, girlfriend, is God. God is number one on your list. Now, Bobby, I don't mean to be mean to you, but God's number 10 on your list. I said, we are going to have a little problem here. I said, because you, Trudy, wants to honor God, serve God, and the number one thing on his list, on Bobby's list, is money, to make money, to work. 
I said, so if that's number one on his list, the Bible says you cannot serve God and money. We're going to have a little issue here. So you got to understand, you're going to have a lot of fights in your marriage about things you don't even realize. Why? Because you don't value the same stuff. And I would have people get mad at me, so mad. They would, st- I mean, when we were finished, they barely let me pray. They would storm out, and I would have people get married. And I'm so sad to say that many of those people, many of them, to this day, are not married anymore. Now, that, I'm not saying that in a bragging way. I'm saying that in a horribly sad way. All because we don't do the homework before. If we'll do the homework before we engage in a marriage that's supposed to be between two people forever, then we need to understand what it means. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to this. Marry someone that loves God more than you. You say, why, why are you saying that, Henny? Here's why I say that. Because if they love God, if, if I love my wife and she knows this. I mean, it's very close to idolatry, but I really love her a lot. But there's someone that I love way more than her. It's not my mother. There's someone I love way more than her, and his name is Jesus. I'm in love with Jesus. Before, I, before she ever asked me to marry her, and I said yes, I... <laughs> I'm what? Lying. I'm lying? <laughs> Baby doll, stay out of my sermon, please. We can discuss it later. (laughs) That's none of your business, but we will have a discussion. We can wrestle out this matter. But the the fact of the matter is, is that marry someone that loves God more than they love you. And you know what will happen? Because if they love God more than they love you, they want to obey God. And if they obey God, they'll do what the Word says. And when you do what the Word says, you can't help but have a great marriage. If you do what God's Word says, find someone that loves you. Listen, if you are in church and you serve God and you honor God and you're part of ministry, don't find somebody that's just hanging around. Just because you meet somebody at church doesn't mean that they're on fire for God, right? We, we, we value what we do. We don't value what we say. And that's the same when we engage. Let me close with this verse because I know some of you are praying, oh God, please let him close. So here's the answer to your prayer. L- look at Psalm 37. Watch this. Psalm 37 verse 4. I love this. Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desires. Commit some things you do to the Lord. Commit what? Everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him, and He will help you. So today, if you're saying, Pastor, listen, some of you are going to have to do the tough thing. Some of you are going to have to have a tough conversation with somebody. Some of you are going to have to walk out of this room and say, I'm going to have to make a phone call. I'm going to have to connect. I'm going to have to have a meeting. And you're going to have to work through some tough stuff. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Some of you are going to have to make some decisions. But why? Because your future is at stake. Your future is at stake. It has nothing to do with me. It's got to do with you and God. And you've got to make a future that is bright in Him. The Bible says God desires to give us a future. But we've got to do what He says. So if we delight in Him, that means we put God first. We delight in Him. We, we say, God, you are the most important to us. Then guess what God does? You see, as you delight in Him, here's what happens to you. God changes your heart. Because some people read this verse like, oh, you know, I, I just do whatever I want and God's going to give it to me. No, that's not what it said. It says you delight in Him. Why? What happens when we delight in Him? We delight in Him. He changes our hearts. And then we begin to delight in the things that God delights. And then guess what? When we do the things that God delights, He'll take care of us. We'll commit everything to Him. Even your dating relationship. Commit it to Him. Say, God, I commit this person to you. You help me. You help me understand. And guess what happens? You trust him, and God will help you through the process. Too many tears have been shed when they were not necessary because we think we know better than God. But when you and I trust him, believe him, guess what? God will bring us to the other side if we believe he will. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. I want to pray with you and for you. I'm just going to ask that you just remain seated just for the next few minutes. And I'm, I'm just going to straight up ask you, maybe you're here today and you know, you're kind of checking things out. I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing that. I'm so glad that you're making a healthy decision and saying, hey, I want to know what this, 
this stuff is all about. You know what? The Bible is so clear that Jesus made a way for us so that we can have a relationship with the Father. What that means is we come to a place where we acknowledge that none of us are going to heaven because of we are good. None of us are going to heaven or, or to a hell because we are bad. It's not about how good you are or bad you are. Here's the thing. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? In order to have that relationship, that relationship we receive through mercy and grace. We come in a moment like this and we humble our hearts and we recognize, God, I need you. I need you to step into my life. I need you to rescue me. I need you to save me because I need a Savior. So in this moment, I, I want to pray with you and for you. And those watching by live stream, if you've never made a commitment, I want you just to linger a little bit before you switch off your phone or your computer or wherever you're watching and just listen for a moment. Because in this moment, the Holy Spirit comes and He, he tugs on your heart and, and He says, I have a future for you. I have a plan. I have a destiny for you. But I want you to understand that without me, life cannot be lived the way it ought to be lived. And God comes and He rescues us through what Jesus does for us on the cross. He shed His blood. He died in our stead so that we don't have to die. The righteous dying for the unrighteous so that we, the unrighteous, might have the mercy of God. And some, sometimes we're in this place where we are confused about our identity, confused about who we are. And it's only by the mercy and grace of God that we discover who we are. So this morning in this room, we've laughed together, we had fun together, we had some, some really tough words we shared together. But in this moment, this is between you and Jesus. This is not about somebody next to you. This is not about somebody you know. This is about you and Jesus. Where are you at with your relationship with God? Are you confident enough to say that if something were to happen to you when you walk out of these doors, that you will open up your eyes in heaven? Or do you say, oh, uh, Pastor, I hope so. I, I, hope, I hope I'm okay. You don't have to hope. You can know. The Bible says, for to as many as received him, he gave them to the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. It takes a moment. It takes a decision. And then it takes an act, an act of faith to believe. And here's what the Bible says. Even that faith that we believe in, God gives it to us. That's a gift. So if you're here today and you've never made a commitment, or maybe you have. Maybe you, you prayed some prayer, but you really haven't followed through. You've kind of been a little bit in, a little bit out. You, you're not truly really pursuing God with all of your life. You realize that your values are kind of all over the place. He's not truly number one in your life. Then today, I'm going to challenge you to make this decision. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you. Those watching by live stream, I want to do the same for you. So if you're in this room and you say, Henny, that's me, would you pray with me? Would you just go ahead and pop your hand up right now and let me see it, and I'll pray for you. Thank you, 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 back there, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, back there, thank you, thank you. Thank you back there. Thank you. I see that. Thank you back there. Thank you. Thank you, young man. I see that. Thank you. I see that. Thank you back there. I see it. You can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. I see it. Thank you. I see it over there. Thank you, sir. I see that. God bless you. If I haven't seen your hand, just pop it up. Thank you. I see that, young man. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you, sir. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. I see that back there. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. I see that. I want to pray with you. There's no magic in these words. It's just a way of committing our lives to Him. And I'm going to ask everybody, if you're, a, if you're a believer today, pray this with us. Let's encourage others. Let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross and shedding your blood so that I can be forgiven. Today, I receive you into my life. Thank you that you forgive me that you give me a fresh start. From this day forward, I want to follow you. From this day forward, be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace that are saving me now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today. Oh, come on out, somebody.